Amen. Thank you, musicians, platform workers. God bless your ministry. Joshua chapter 9. If you'll turn there to Joshua chapter 9. I want to tell you a story this evening. Before I tell it, the story is my introduction, but my introduction needs an introduction. This story is true. Every fact I'm about to tell you is absolutely true. These are facts. These things really happened. However, the conclusion or the lesson of this story is obviously up for debate, which, of course, you will discover is the whole point of this sermon. Star Trek is, or was anyway, the most popular TV show of a couple of generations. There was the original Star Trek uh, of my parents' generation, uh, which, uh, you know, it's technically was sci-fi. If you watch it now, it's comedy. Uh, but then, but then there was Star Trek, the next generation, Star Trek TNG. How many of you were Star Trek fans? You nerds. It's all right. (laughs) From 1987 up to 1994, Star Trek The Next Generation was just an absolute smash hit. So 1995, there was now a new one, Star Trek Voyager. The first season was just okay. Ratings were just okay. Season two bombed. It was so bad Uh, that they were going to cancel it. Now, this is a a show that's been on air now for uh, decades, and they're getting ready to cancel it because it's doing so bad. Here's what happened. It was so bad that all the Trekkies, listen, you know you're a nerd. Not you. I'm not saying, you know. When you're such a big fan of a TV show that they've actually got a name for you. The show was so bad that all of the Trekkies began to write letters to the producers saying, essentially, this show stinks. And they created such a fuss that the producers were in a panic. What are we going to do? They hate the show. Well, this is television. And so they tried the age-old trick. What you need to do is get an attractive woman, add some sex appeal. So they added a new character, Seven of Nine, played by Jerry Ryan. And, of course, you know, it's just Star Trek. There's no plot, right? I mean, if you ever watched it, it's it's just Star Trek. But this new character was an absolute smash hit. Season three went on to break records, and they went on for several successful seasons. But there was a problem with this, is that this actress that they picked, Jerry Ryan, was married. Star Trek began to be very successful. The work hours were grueling, and so her home life began to suffer. Her marriage began to fall apart because of the success of the TV show. Eventually, they got divorced. Her and her husband, Jack Ryan, were divorced. But what's interesting is the divorce proceedings were sealed. No one knew why they got divorced. This wouldn't have been an issue, but Jack Ryan decided to get into politics. He ran for Senate in 2004. He was an ideal Republican candidate. Good education, wealthy, successful. He looked like a Republican boss, and he was winning. He won the Republican primary. His Democratic opponent was young, inexperienced, and looked like it was going to be an easy win for Jack Ryan. However, you know, when you're a politician, people dig up dirt. And so they dug up the dirt and they said his divorce proceedings were sealed. And so they filed a motion. You need to open that up. If you're going to run for office, we want to know why he was divorced from the Star Trek actress. So they did. And the details that came out were uh, salacious and repugnant so bad that he immediately quit the race. Now, this was right before the election. The Republicans could not find a substitute for him. And so his opponent won in an overwhelming landslide. The guy he was running against that won in a landslide was none other than Barack Obama. First time senator. And he won so conclusively that right after the election, Democratic bosses said, you need to tap him for president, he'll win. And so this is the story of how some Star Trek nerds accidentally elected a U.S. president. (laughs) 
Like I said, the facts are true, whether the conclusion is true. I'll leave that up for you to decide. You know, in life, life is governed by a number of invisible laws, right? The law of gravity, right? Right now, you are under the pull of gravity. I mean, some of us more than others, but it's a law. And you can't revoke it. What do you do? You just have to learn how to live with it, right? One of the laws we live by is the law of unintended consequences. And this will impact all of your life. Now, you can't repeal the law of unintended consequences. But what you need to do is learn how to live within it. We're going to read a scripture in Joshua 9. And I'm going to talk about the law of unintended consequences. Joshua 9, you can read with me beginning in verse 3. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they were craftily, went, pretended to be ambassadors, took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old sandals on their feet, old garments on themselves. All the bread was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua at the camp and said to him, We have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant with us. Now that wasn't true, that was a lie. They lived right there. Verse 7, the men of Israel uh, said to them, perhaps you dwell among us. How could we make a covenant with you? But they said, no, we are your servants. Joshua said, where are you from? And they said, we're from way over there. That's how y'all been talking to me the last eight years. I'll say, where are you from? Oh, a long ways away. That's not what I said. Where are you from? You wouldn't know where it is. Where are you from? And really what you're trying to say is, Pastor, we know you can't pronounce it, and I don't want to hear you try. That's what you're really saying. But that's what they said. We're from a long ways away. Verse 9, and from a very far country your servants have come because the name of the Lord your God. We heard of his name and all that he did in the land of Egypt. Now we're going to skip down to verse 14. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them the law of unintended consequences. Let's talk first about rash decisions. Now, our scripture is about a decision that is made rashly. The word rash means proceeding from a lack of careful consideration. But this isn't necessarily just about time. It's not as if when every decision someone gives you a list, you need to plan, you need to think about this one for 10 minutes, or this decision takes an hour, or this decision takes a week. To say that a decision is a rash decision is a statement about the size of the decision. For example, You cannot make a rash decision about toppings on a burger, right? Because it's just not that important. You're going to have another burger tomorrow. If you get it wrong today, no big deal. But you can make a rash decision about who you marry because that's important. So that's the point. In our scripture, we see that the rashness of a decision is proportionate to the size of the decision. So think about what this looks like. There are decisions made in haste. In our scripture, it's interesting. There's like a detail missing. Uh, Now, for context, and we'll get there in a minute, but God told Joshua, when you get there, kill everybody. That was God. You know, when God talks, you should kind of listen. Right? He didn't have to make this big decision. He could have taken time, but any decision has a great possibility for causing you harm. There are decisions made without counsel. In our scripture, there is no indication that Joshua or the elders asked anybody's advice. We don't get the indication that they began to ask, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think? Do you know these guys? Does anyone know where they come from? Does anyone recognize that accent? You know, this is the dilemma is that as we get older, we begin to feel more mature and we begin to think, you know what? I should know this by now. Have you ever felt that way? You know, one of the weird things about growing up is that one day you look around and you realize, oh, I'm the people that people ask for advice. Right? When you were younger, you always had someone else to ask. 
hey, dad, how do you, right, what do you, and all of a sudden one day people ask you and you go, I don't know. You know, it's very scary when you realize that you are the adult supervision. Has anyone had that experience? Where you go, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, if I'm the smart one, we're all in trouble to us. And then we feel like, well, I should just make a decision because I should know this. I remember calling Pastor Greg. Uh, you know, I, I, I call him all the time, ask him for advice, ask for questions. But over the years, those conversations have changed. And I've called him and he's said, I asked him, and he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep, yep, okay. Well, I don't know. You have to figure it out. Right? It's one of those like, uh, why do you think I'm calling you? Right? But, and so what he's trying to get me to do is mature. But I want to tell you, you're never going to get to a point where you don't need advice, where you don't need to ask someone. And then we see that rash decisions are decisions we make without God. Here in our scripture, we see the ultimate problem. They did not consult God at all. Verse 15, Joshua, uh, 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 sorry, verse 14, the men of Israel took their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of God. Now, you know what? Joshua was a good guy. I don't think this was evil. He didn't wake up that morning and be like, you know what? I'm not asking God nothing. I'm a man. I'm a full grown adult. I don't think that was it. It was just some guys. They were hungry. He didn't think he needed to ask God. You know, he was praying the day before he prayed about decisions, right? But then this day, this was, he said, you know what? I don't even need to pray, but I know the answer to this one already. And so here is where we get in trouble is when we begin making decisions without ever talking to God about it. So think about what kinds of decisions these are in our lives. It can be things that we make allowance for. In our scripture, they made an allowance. They said, you know what? That's okay. I will permit that in my home. I will permit that in my life or in my children or in my heart. This was a foolish decision, but it's something they made allowance for. It can be maybe things you emphasize. You know, when I was a disciple, Pastor Greg told me you need to celebrate what matters to you. Because if you emphasize something, then that will get in your disciples. But, you know, sometimes you can do that wrong, right? You guys know I love backpacking. And so uh, when I go to the Grand Canyon, uh, I get great sermon illustration or inspiration because there's no phones. There's no nothing. And I come back. And so one of the guys came and I was just sharing. Oh, man, it was amazing. And God was speaking to me. And so one of the guys came and said, so, Pastor, do we need to go backpacking? Why? Well, because that's where you get sermon inspiration from. No, bro, I realized I was overemphasizing something. I was making too big of a deal out of it. But we can all do that. We can emphasize or prioritize the wrong things. Maybe we can de-emphasize things. You know, a lot of times as Christians, we put things to the side or we de-emphasize things that matter. So let's think then about the law of unintended consequences. Here is the dilemma. When we make rash decisions, they usually feel so insignificant. Now, I'm going to ask you for a moment to be honest. I know that's, that's painful sometimes, but has anyone here ever made a bad decision? Has that ever happened? Most of you being honest, that's good. The rest of you get saved for heaven's sake. But I'll bet if you think back to those bad decisions or any of them, they didn't seem like that big of a deal, did they? It was like, yeah, whatever. I'll go over here. I'll take that. I'll, I'll eat this from a questionable food vendor. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time, right? In our scripture, if the music had changed, you know how it is in video games, right? You're just walking along. Do, 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 dun, 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 dun. You would have stopped, right? And if any of you recognize that music, it's because you're old. <laughs> right? If life was like that, it would be, see, they, they seem like no big deal. You make decisions, I'll do this, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. Maybe this, maybe not do that. And we don't realize that they are a big deal. The reality is we get ourselves in trouble because so often these decisions come along and they just don't seem that important. In our scripture, it was just a few guys. They were hungry and they said they were from far away. You can't pronounce it anyway, but make a treaty with us. 
Two things that we see in our scripture. Number one, things will be given life that should die. In our scripture, this was literal. God had commanded them to kill the Gibeonites. Joshua 9, 24, the Gibeonites said, We were clearly told that your God commanded his servant Moses to give you the land and destroy all of the inhabitants. It's not just that God had told Moses and that God had told Joshua. It's that everybody knew it. It was clearly commanded that these things should not live. And I want to tell you, sometimes the unintended consequences of our decisions are that things live that ought to die. We allow carnality to live in us when it should die. We allow worldliness to live in our hearts or our family when it should die or rebellion or the spirit of assimilation. Listen, we give life to things that we ought to be putting to death. You know what's tragic is that oftentimes we make the excuse of usefulness for why we're letting these things live. In verse 27 of our scripture, it says, And then Joshua made them woodcutters and water carriers for the people of Israel. Now think about this. God said, you see all of these people? They need to die. Joshua says, nah, we're going to let them live. But it's okay, God. I've got a better plan. I'm going to make them work for us. I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, this is what I see very often in people's hearts. I'll challenge people. This should die, right? You need to kill this. Oh, but pastor, I've got a great idea, right? I've got this great new plan. I know, I know that you think, but what if, you know? This morning, we're talking about the people that want to evangelize in bars. Come on now. You're just trying to make a wood carrier out of something that ought to be dead. Amen, Pastor Heimrich. Thank you. Years ago, our fellowship leadership made a decision. We are, as pastors, we are not going to be involved in, we're not going to support, and we are going to speak against social media. But I'm going to tell you why we did that. Because one of the unfortunate parts of our job is that we have to zip up all the body bags. Every time someone's life is destroyed by pornography, every time someone's marriage is ripped apart by an old connection that popped up because of their social media, we are the ones that have to clean it up and console the grieving. So we made up our minds, but the problem is, is you tell that to people, and they're like, oh, pastor, you're so old-fashioned. Listen, I use my Insta to witness. And you're doing one of these things. You've got a Bible. You're like, hashtag blessed. People will come to church, pastor. Kill it. Kill it. No, pastor, you don't understand. Every 18 seconds on TikTok, someone's meeting Jesus. No, no, no. Kill it. No, but it's a great water carrier and a woodcutter, which is exactly what Joshua did. And for 500 years, the people of Israel paid the consequences. So we give life to things that ought to die. And ultimately, the wrong things gain influence over your future. In Deuteronomy 7, this was the command. And when God delivers them, you shall destroy them. Make no covenant with them or show mercy, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. You know, here's the problem. is the greatest impact of unintended consequences we felt down the road. It's not going to be felt in your life or in your generation. It will be something that is experienced long down the road. These minor allowances can alter the course of a future. In our scripture, all he did was be nice to some hungry travelers. And for 500 years, the Gibeonites were uh, a ball and chain to the children of Israel. They were a hindrance at every step. All the way into 2 Samuel 21, as David is king, Saul was king. He had done wrong, and now there's a famine for three years. And David cries out, why? And God says, because of the Gibeonites. Now they have changed the course of the nation's future because they were unwilling to put them to death. This is why 
little things matter so much. Because it's impossible to see the effects of these decisions a generation or two generations down the road. So let's talk finally about mitigating unintended consequences. Now, the difficulty of this law, as I said in the beginning, is you can't revoke it. Wouldn't it be great if we could just vote all in favor of revoking the law of unintended consequences? Say aye. Aye, right? It's not possible. It's one of those things we are absolutely going to live with. The purpose of this sermon is not that we can eliminate it, but my point is to get you to think about it. One of my pastor's greatest skills is that he can think a few decisions down the road. I'll ask him questions, and he'll say, but if you do that, then won't this guy say that? And then if he says that, remember, isn't his wife the one that said this? And he's going, he's like playing chess, and I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, all he's doing is he's just thinking ahead. That's the point. If you want to deal with the law of unintended consequences, you're going to have to learn how to think a few steps ahead. And so here are some practical considerations to help you. If you would lock in on these three things, God could help you tremendously. Number one, I'm going to blow your minds. Are you ready for this? Cedric is. I hope the rest of you are. This is heavy stuff. Not every problem is a crisis. There's a difference between problem and crisis. Problem is one of those things, yeah, I got to get around to that, you know. But a crisis means I got to do it right now. In fact, it is extraordinarily rare that you are going to deal with a crisis. Most of the things we deal with are problems. Problems mean you've got time. And so listen, the point is, is when you face something, I don't have to solve this right now. I don't have to fix this today. I have people, they have called me, right? You know, one of the, you, you all have done it. You've called me at two in the morning, right? And I answer and, and, you know, I, I try my best. I try my, <clears throat> hello, like I'm awake or something <laughs> and I'm trying to speak intelligently. And then I will ask, I'll ask, okay, okay, hold on, hold on a second. And I've asked this question, is anybody bleeding? Are the cops there? Can we talk about this in the morning? Because there's a difference between a problem and a crisis. Because we feel that it's a crisis. Pastor, my son was late for curfew. Right? And you're, oh, okay. Well, I bet if we talk about this tomorrow, it'll still be the same, right? So let's talk about it tomorrow. I don't have to be make, uh, making them right now. I refuse to be forced to make decisions on the spot. I refuse to be hijacked by a false sense of urgency. In our scripture, they made a decision uh, about this. It only took them three days to discover the Gibeonites were lying to them. What if they had waited? If they had just held on for a couple of days, tell you whatever that decision is that you are wrestling with right now, you've got time. You, you've got a day or two. You've got a week. You can pray about this. You can ask. So listen, not every problem is a crisis. Number two, not every opportunity is a blessing. In our scripture, that's what they said. All they did was read the packaging, right? Amazing. Did you see? They will be Water carriers and woodcutters. Oh, what a great deal. All they read was the ad copy on the label. They didn't look beneath the surface. Listen, not every opportunity is a blessing. Not every uh, possible open door is all of the great uh, things that it says it is. Listen, so lock this in when you're facing a decision. Not every opportunity is a blessing. 
Of course, many of them are, but not all of them. That's why we ask. And number three, most important, you can never get too much counsel. You're ne- There's never going to be a point in which God's going to speak from heaven. Okay, enough advice. That's never going to happen. There's never going to be a point when God says, stop asking me for wisdom. There's never going to be a point when God says, stop asking your pastor for wisdom. Listen, seek God in every decision. Pray about him. Go to the scripture. I know this seems like a no-brainer, but, but man, so often people don't do this. They're making life-altering decisions without praying about it. Ask for direction in this decision. Ask for revelation so you're prepared for the next decision. Ask for understanding. God, help me to see further down the road. Seek wisdom. Listen, if you will examine scripture and you'll pay attention to life, God will elevate your wisdom level. There's times you can make a judgment call and God has given you wisdom. One of the most inspiring things I've watched leaders do is ask advice. I've called Pastor Greg, Pastor Ruby, Pastor Payne at various times, and I've had every one of them tell me some variation of, you know, I don't know, but let me ask. I'll find out. Listen, that is wisdom. Ask for advice. But I will close with a warning about unintended consequences. Here's the difficulty. When you use a phrase like this, unintended consequences is that we, we will throw it back. You know, something will blow up and we'll be like, oh, Pastor Heimber, you won't believe what happened. It's that old law of unintended consequences again. You know, the problem with that is that I've almost never encountered someone who is being held accountable by the law of unintended consequences who wasn't already warned. Because that's what you see in our scripture. God told them. God made it very clear, Deuteronomy 7, when I bring you in, destroy them or else it will ruin your future they disobeyed and it ruined their future i talked to people pastor heimberg i just can't believe it you know i was talking to that guy i was talking to that girl and did you know can you believe they were a scammer i just can't believe it now my life's messed up i told you that I've had people, financial decisions. Oh, you will not believe. I just can't believe. You, you, you know what? It's amazing. You know, I haven't paid my tithe in 10 years, and would you believe it? My finances are a wreck. I told you that. So that's the problem with the law of unintended consequences. It's only unintended. It's never unknown. We often find ourselves in a place where we are paying price tags. We hoped we wouldn't have to pay, but someone... Somewhere already warned us. You know, we have been blessed over the years. As a fellowship, we've had wise leadership. This church has had uh, pastors come and preach. We have Pastor Mitchell come in all the time. We've had leadership in here. You've got Pastor Payne, one of the greatest leaders in our fellowship coming in here. They have wisdom. Let us not be the people that second-guess the wisdom that's given and find ourselves paying penalties to the law of unintended consequences. Amen. Let's bow our heads together for a moment. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed.